streaming live on Facebook. Now we're recording. Okay, we're ready to go. Great. Hello, everybody. Ho, po. Oh, whoa, whoa. Oh. It's our holiday poetry open house with Cultivating Voices live poetry. I want to welcome each one of you from wherever you're joining us around the world. We, we have an incredible whirlwind of poets today. I'm your host, Sandy Yunone, welcoming members who have been with us since we began our first live open mic on Sunday, March 29th. To those of you in the Zoom room for your very first time, to those of you watching us live on Facebook, or those of you who will be watching us as a recording uh, later on, uh, and those even those new members who have joined us yesterday, and everyone in between, welcome one and all. Um, it is extraordinary to have us gathering today. I wish everyone peace and love and tidings of poetry joy in this season of light as we move from Hanukkah to solstice to Christmas to Kwanzaa and other sacred celebrations as we move into the new year of promise and poetry in 2021. I don't have to tell you what the year 2020 has been like. We've all had our unique journeys and experiences. Um, but for me, the highlight certainly has been cultivating voices and meeting all the poets that I've been able to meet. I'm grateful for every single person who has graced cultivating voices, live poetry with your voice, either through one of our early open mics to our new book showcases, our special event readings, or by your presence as a devoted listener, a person posting on our Facebook group page. You've really kept my heart, my ears, and my soul very nimble through these very difficult times with your remarkable outpouring of humanity. I want to um, give a very special shout out to uh, a few people, those folks who have been running reading series during this time. Um, and I wanna particularly call out two reading series that have been beacons for me. And that is the Not the Time to be Silent reading series and Lim out of Limerick, Ireland with Siobhan Potter and Doris Seifer, and uh, as well as uh, the reading series Cactus out of Placitas, New Mexico with hosts John Roach and Jules Nyquist. Um, there are many others that I have enjoyed immensely during this year, but those two were really beacons for me to help me think about how to navigate Cultivating Voices Live. And I really am grateful to the organizers for your vision of those series. I also could not do this every week without Don Krieger who stepped up very early to help us make that transition from the Facebook Live era, as I like to call it, where we were giving tutorials to each one of you every single week to be able to stream live to Facebook. Those of you who were with us in those early weeks know what it was like um, and you endured and we're very grateful we also got some great poetry out of it those early, early weeks when we were reeling from the pandemic. And, um, and it was quite a sanctuary to be able to come together in those early weeks. And of course, um, my sister, Elizabeth Ann, who many of you know, particularly those of you who've been with us early, because she was the one that was doing those tutorials with you, could not be with us today. We're gonna do a special um, holiday message for you on Christmas from our house here in Connecticut. Um, but she, she's working today. She sends her amazing regards to each one of you. She's very grateful to, um, to having met you all and to connect. So those are my early shout outs to folks and thanks for being with us. 
Well, today we have gathered for what is intended to be a slice of what we have experienced poetically together in 2020 with an eye toward more rem remarkable poetry experiences in 2021. Um, when I realized that I was going to book new book showcases for 2021, I realized, yep, I'm in it for another year. So we're committed for the next year moving forward. And we have a grand party today of special guest readers and open mic readers who will share work. And later in the program, we're going to unveil an incredible reading that we've been planning behind the scenes that we'll be hosting in February, 2021. And we'll give that reveal later on in the program. So let's get to our party of poets. Um, I'll, um, I will introduce the special guests but then I will call out the names of the folks reading in the open mic. And a reminder that our open mic readers will be reading one poem up to three minutes. And our first poets in the open mic starting us off today for our poetry, our oh, ho, po, oh, open house are Marcella Raymond, Joanne James, and Amit Dahiyabad Shah. Okay, Marcella, take it away. Yes, can you hear me now? <laughs> uh, thank you all so much. Thank you, Sandy, for um, putting this together. What a great way to celebrate the holidays. I just can't think of anything more fun. Um, I, I'm going to read a poem called St. John of God, and though uh, I'm not Catholic, I have a fascination with Catholic saints and have written many poems about Catholic saints. Um, St. John of God was a 16th century Portuguese soldier um, who dedicated his life to um, to the church when he had uh, visions of St. Raphael and the baby Jesus tugging on his coat. Um, and eventually he was institutionalized because they say that he um, straddled the line between the heavenly world and the earthly world. Mm -hmm. And that that sort of um, existing within the veil drove him mad. So I'm dedicating this poem um, to the solstice, which is one of those liminal times when the veil might be thin. And, and also I'd like to dedicate it to all the COVID dead who have recently crossed that veil. St. John of God. What if there is no dreaming, no dancing, no opalescent mist in which we float suddenly weightless or winged? What if trumpets don't sound and in no distant fog do chords come clean from harps? What if there never were seraphim swallowed in flames of love so radiant we turn our heads? What if there's only a pause, a mirrored moment in which we see most of us for the first time ourselves. And in that moment, know with certainty that we have been bathed in love since the beginning. That all along, while we wept and prayed, saved unanswered letters, left the receiver on the hook, we were pure love twisted into human shapes. So like impulse and receptor cell, we fit and could only spark together, tendon and bone going up in a flash of love. So radiant people turn their heads. What if that moment is all we have? One gauzy white curtain drawn quickly over a small dim window then out, out into the long night. St. John, was it looking out too soon that drove you mad? Or could you bless me with that moment now? Walk me past the mirror now, with the window still wide open, curtain billowing like a sail, 
until I know love, 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 that sea of flame and beautiful sorrow, so radiant, I turn my head. Thank you. Great, Joanne James is next. Hi. Hello, everyone. I, I picked out a poem <clears throat> about joy to end this year. Um, I'm, I'm here from the Northwest in the United States in Eugene, Oregon. This is a true story. Um, it's called The Bug Notes, which was a little journal, a little notebook that I carried. I had titled it The Bug Notes. And this is a trip up to the Redwoods um, just north of Santa Cruz in the Santa Cruz Mountains. And it was a Big Basin State Park which is the oldest state park in the state of California. The bug notes, angel food cake and sliced pears for lunch, an army of hungry ants. One rose like a globe of, one rose like a globe of wishes rising to the sun in an untended forest of redwood bay and laurel. Everything is hidden in a forest, the horizon is immediate and contextual, a ritual of greens and darkness below the spellbound sky. Oh, lift the edges back, those clouds of terror and necessity, those unfound, those perpetually waiting. And if one rose rises in this deep forest, I know someone somewhere has cared for it. I am speaking to you from the bug notebook in my eloquent perpetual somnolence. I am always falling where I saw one rose rising, where it grows just the right shade of shell pink with its rose perfume, the subtle beauty where I am always falling in the jungle darkness of forest. I am always waking up to the most beautiful day of the roses. I am always waking from the cough of sleep, the sleeve of doubt, and night, like a licorice wheel, rains salt and sweet onto this holy ground. Thank you. <laughs> Amit can unmute and join us. Can you hear me? Hello? Yeah, you're good. Um, my offering uh, the small thing called the awakening, because one of the strange paradoxes of this virus is it is helping us to turn our eyes upon ourselves and our condition, the human condition. It's a paradox because it's also gonna help us eventually to become better people. Uh, poems called The Awakening. When we rose, the sun was rising. Our direction came from morning light. This is no idle minds uprising. We have braved the darkest night. From here we'll take that other road of journeys great on unknown trails, refreshed beyond the spirits of history, deeply drink from wisdom's grails, turns and heights a long and lonely journey lies ahead of us into a dawn of new beginnings and a new abiding trust. It glimmers well beyond the sunset beyond every fear and man-made wall, knowing well a new dawn's waiting, the clarity of our clarion call, the invocation of a new beginning and an equal light for all. Thank you. 
Thank you. Namaste. What a remarkable beginning to our reading. Our open mic poets will be joining interspersed with our special guests. And my first special guest today is Risa Denenberg. My, I knew Risa before Cultivating Voices, so I have images in my head, but the image I have of Risa in Cultivating Voices is of her sitting in her car. The first time she read was in the Poetry Pride Parade and she was sitting in her car reading. And it was, it, it was, qu it was quite a thing. Uh, we've had these interesting moments that have happened during the readings. And uh, that is certainly not the enduring image I have of you, Risa, but I, but I get a little chuckle thinking of you in, the, in our special event, one of our first big ones of you, the first reader in the car, you know, scrambling to read from, from right there in your vehicle. Well, I also want to give a shout out because Risa is also the co-editor of Headmistress Press, who was a sponsor of that Poetry Pride Parade reading and has been a wonderful reader with us during the whole time, um, as well as getting ready for your own new book showcase reading. I want to give a shout out to let all of you know, join us on May 23rd, when Risa will be reading with Kelly Russell Agadon, Diane Zeus, and Mancho Alvarado in our new book showcase. So congratulations on the new book. Thanks for all you do, Risa. Thanks for all your support. I'm going to do something that I have to do. I keep getting kicked out of Zoom. So I'm going to turn my, my, I'm going to turn my video off and read. Can you hear me? Yep. All right. I can hear you. I, and I want to show you my, okay. I want to just show you my book. Um, I have a new book, so I'm reading from it. <laughs> And it's called Post Human, and I'm going off a uh, video so that I can see it. I'm the first four names of human, and hopefully, uh, you'll be interested enough in the story to want to buy the book. It was published by Floating Bridge Press, and it was a finalist in their 2020 uh, chapel contest. Lisa, I think we've lost you. Well, I'm here right now. Can okay. you hear me now? Yep. It's, it's a little spotty, I'm but gonna, yeah. I'm very sorry. I, I, usually it does well, but I have days when it doesn't. Yep. So if I can't get through this, then carry on. One, it was a warm day in April when the colleagues died on the porch. The spider plant bowed its swords in supplication, scorched by nearby fires. Parched, wandering Jew wandered no more. Wrapped defiant to the jade and snake plants in near spring, then died in summer's. Mm. Mm. Okay. Yeah, we lost you again. All right. I'm so sorry, Risa. I'm gonna move on to the next open micers and let's see if we could get you back uh, with a little clearer signal. Um, okay, I, I'm, I'm in and out, so you may as well go on with that. Me. I'm very sorry, I was really looking forward to reading. <laughs> I know. I'm so sorry. I, um, of course, always look forward to hearing you, but it's, yeah, it's just... Why I was in the car on that day, because <laughs> I got in my car that day, because I was having bad reception that day, too. 
Yeah. All right. I'm okay. going to hang around and listen. Thanks for everything. And we'll be hearing from Risa many more times in the future, particularly that new book showcase coming up. Her book is Post Human from Floating, uh, Floating Bridge Press. Okay, on the open mic next, we have Ann Spears and David Bridges. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Sandy. Uh, in the pandemic, the adolescent boys who are now teenagers have returned to playing the card games where they are they tell no one they meet, but they meet in the alley and they play cards for um, it's like Dungeons and Dragons, except it's, they use cards. So I'm going to take you Christmas shopping. And um, uh, my name is Anne Spires. It's very Scottish, as opposed to my husband, who's German. So um, this is called Fat Pack. Christmas shopping, Seattle, for Magic, the Gathering, Battle of Zanzibar. One clerk his invisible cigarette lolling between his lips says, just like an eight-year-old to send his grandma for trading cards sold out first day back in October. I go to Target, sold out. Where next, I ask of twins, Humpty and Dumpty, big boys, earrings, low pants, mean faces. Somehow I sweeten their day. They smile shrug and say, try Pike Place Market collectibles. A techie dude butts in, yep, go there, go there. Cutouts of Darth Vader and Mickey Mouse guard the entrance. The clerk who is up on magic cards is off. And the in guy says, no new issue. How about the old set? Probably not, says the techie dude. In the blink of fluorescent light, he is too thin too thinly bearded ever to be Santa Claus. Closer, he smells like a bad elf. The clerk says, try Pike Street. Dark now, I walk up Pike, avoiding bikers without flashers and flashers without helmets. Someone sings, hang low, sweet chariot. A sign says, teriyaki, but I order Korean dumpling. The owner in lovely suit and dangle earring says, too late for those, my best. She grills me. I answer rice on my fork. Yes, my daughters are Asian. Yes, they went to university. Yes, I have grandchildren. Yes, good to me. I am Christmas shopping. Next door, Gamma Ray has trading cards. Not the fat pack, but new skinny packs. In seasonal cooperation, the clerk, owner, and I select according to our prejudices. Two packs of octopi unfurling red tentacles, three packs of brown boy on dragon, one pack of blonde boy with no masculine attributes. I say, sort of Cinderella princey. No, totally gay, says a techie dude materializing at my elbow. But so white, I say. The clerk jumps in. So is a muscle man, fourth choice. His boss says, no, he looks hapa, maybe Samoan and crept. You have no women, I accuse. Yes, one lady warrior, she's endowed. I buy all but none of her. They gift me a card. Outside, a shadow offers me something good for 20 bucks. It's been years since someone asked. The notice makes me happy. Walking back to my car, I look over my shoulder. The techie dude is not following me. Under a street light, I read the gifted card. Owls fill the night. Ribbons of blood hung in the air. Thank you so much. Thanks, Ann. David, would you please unmute and share your... Uh, thank you, Sa Sandra and Don and, and all your team for this uh, uh, incredible reading series. 
And um, thanks to all the poets reading today, um, you're kind of warm, eternal logs on the fire. Um, this poem is dedicated to book lovers. Ode to Reading. There is no frigate like a book to take us lands away. Emily Dickinson. Reading is an introvert's paradise. Reading is curiosity's candy. Reading is a mind to mind massage with fingers of words. Reading is deep work at play. Reading is a library for greater freedom. Reading is a pilgrimage to print passion. Reading is empathy enhanced. Reading is pure expansion, a blue balloon without horizons. Reading is grandma's grade six birthday gift, Gulliver's Travels. Reading is a cerebral cannibal eating the heart of a writer. Reading is standing in the light of a light that lightens your light. Reading is a transmission of what one knows to others who crave to know. Reading is imprinting, imparting, impressing, implying, and improving. Reading is a flaming soul, a fire to set another afire. Reading is the kingdom of kindness to your eyes. Reading is a smart way to stay away from your smartphone. Reading is a mystery revealed in minute measure. Reading is ageless friendships born inside embryonic pages of a book. Reading is hands down the best way to relax from an overwired world. Reading is a cryptic saying, read, reread, and you shall find. Reading is a brilliant way to banish boredom. Readers is reader, uh, reader, reading is readers hang out in a, in a universal language lounge. Reading is the quintessential quest. Reading is book mountains, the world's mind speaking across peaks of history. Reading is the best nighttime tonic. Reading is the sharpest weapon against ignorance. Reading is an atlas making you worldly. Reading is an illuminative star fallen to earth. Reading is an art that gives heart gravity and grace. Reading is civilization's most important cultural treasure, books. Reading is Romeo and Juliet hailing an Uber cab while someone is trying to kill a mockingbird as Alice in Wonderland walks by talking to Ulysses who sees Catcher in the Rye chasing Gone with the Wind. Simultaneously, a streetcar named Desire in a brave new world stops for the handmaid's tale. On board, Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone sits beside Lord of the Rings. They see Dante, a laughing madman running through the centuries proclaiming, the world is a divine comedy. Reading is a story that has no ending page for it is imagination's endless long tale. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, David. Joining us from Canada. Thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure to be in your company as we've been at different events. And Anne, thank you so much. Sorry for the mispronunciation. Uh, <laughs> beautiful poem. All right, friends, my next special guest today is Indran Amir to the Nayagam. And what can I say about Indran?
Indran is one of those true, true poetry ambassadors, um, as most of you are, as all of you are, obviously, or you wouldn't be here. Indran's an editor of the Beltway Poetry Journal, a, a, a poet, translator, editor, and reading organizer extraordinaire. You're, oh, we're always seeing Indran's posts on cultivating voices from a, for, for a variety of reasons. And I was so grateful when Indran reached out to me um, to inquire about reading on cultivating voices and has stayed with us all throughout. So much gratitude. Thank you. I so look forward to your reading today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sandy. It's a, a real pleasure and honor to be part of Cultivating Voices. And I'm going to read some new poems. Um, uh, first one, Healing on the Altar. I have become a serial investigator, marking my targets, remembering how we met, what we spoke about, to what edge did we walk on the cliff and did we look over? Yes, recalling our quarrels. Yes, that there is a way out of the maze to shed skin of the ancient jealous curse, its brutal whiplash, facial wound healed, but interior gash suppurating. These lines bearing witness need to research the crime, to dig up amulets from the garden buried under the mango tree to understand why those first blows rained upon me as a five-year-old after bloodying my brother, setting patterns for later fighting, wounding always my sense of place, causing great need and desolation, looking to heal in another's arms when all healing begins in the heart and head of the penitent alone, kneeling on the altar in the private chapel of the mind at home. Perennial. After a few days in the monastery, retired, gathering thoughts in silence, I've come back to you renewed. I cannot stay away for too long. The partnership begun in a silver spring restaurant, polished as if by a fairy's wing, brushing ring, talisman, the not so secret complicity, shining, the delicious dream this morning of a cap a t-shirt emblazoned with logo, printing press, theory of the lyric as antidote for our times of climate war, irreversible change. No man, woman or spirit can take away what grows on its own, shedding leaves, flourishing green on the writing desk at winter's beginning. The plant beside my fingers, the hope said to you, reading. And um, I'll finish with um, this poem called Living Will, which an earlier poem from my book, Coconuts on Mars, Living Will. One day I will sit down with my soul and write that I've loved every bird that flew, every monkey on the branch, every elephant charging through the grass. I will say I love you as much as the baby geckos campering past my foot the snake rustling under the wood cut and stacked in my yard. I will say I have loved every creature, every song, every turn in the road, and I will be lying with my eyes open and my eyes closed. I am not God. I am not even the dog loyal to his master who misses him blind like his daughter in Lima, which I call at night until the next time we meet in dreams via chat, cheek to cheek, Remembering always that in paradise there are no trains or roads or seas or death, no going away or arriving, doors and garden open, souls who come and go smiling, and all the angels, all birds, all dolphins, all men and women in song and dancing, and why not reciting the Song of Solomon, the epic poems, the love songs that consoled when we set off on the roads, hopped on trains and aeroplanes, got caught in traffic in our head, said goodbye before saying hello, 
Did I know you down there? You were the green grocer I walked past going to school in London. Oh, my dear, how beautiful you are, Pauline, with ripe red hair, who shared the religion prize with me at St. Vincent's on Bladford Street. But you may be alive still, and I'm not ready to meet my maker, to be plucked from the cycle of rebirth. Not yet. I have poems to compose, children to raise, earth to cultivate. Come back later, angel. I have my will to revise. Thank you. I, I probably have read just the right amount. <laughs> Thank you very much, Sandy and all. Thank you. And now our open mic, Gail Hammond and Melody Wilson. I thought I saw them join, but it's not. I'm, I'm okay. Here, but I don't see Gail. Okay, go right ahead, Melody. Thank you. My name's on participants, but I'll go first, and then maybe the, she'll look back. So, hi, I'm Melody Wilson. I'm in Beaverton, Oregon. Um, I've only come to a couple of these. My Sundays are complicated, and um, I was really glad to be able to hit this one. And so I thought I'd. I don't have any holiday poems, and so I thought I would do one and I heard the Irish prime minister talk about Santa Claus having access to houses despite COVID that he, he didn't he would be waived from the requirements and so I went kind of on that and this poem is called Leap of Faith and it has an epigraph which is from the World Health Organization um, I understand the concern for Santa because he is of older age but I can tell you that Santa Claus is immune to this virus. Sometimes the universe shivers, catching a glimpse of itself in the mirror, like the shuddering tip of the tongue at the end of a puppy's long yawn, or the somersault, head over feet, sunk deep in the mattress right before sleep. Wonder is wedged between what we know and what we don't why the elevator works, why the diet doesn't, everything's a gamble. The letter addressed to the North Pole, chemotherapy, prayer. The bargain between our hearts and the world, will there be enough? Will it work? We teeter at the edge of what we need and what we know, like water from the tap, light from the switch, the instant the bicycle balances. And the answer to the question is yes. Like your father out of work one December and a clatter overhead, the neighbor boy on the roof, the gleaming tree wrestled home from the gym after prom. Ho, 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 he cries and slides down the shingles. Your sisters dance and shout in the yard. The gap is wide. It can barely hold all the magic. Thank you. I think we're getting Gail unmuted. And uh, I've asked Don to help me with that. There you are. Hey, hey, Sandy. Um, hi, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here today. I was super excited. Can't think of a better way to um, celebrate the holidays together here. I've enjoyed everybody. and. Um, Indran's book, Coconut from Mars, is a great book, especially I like how he talks about technology and its its potency and its um its its hindrances too. So especially during this time, there's so many things about it that, that seemed really, really apt and entering possibility of a new language during this time. So it's a, really a pleasure to hear your poems, Indran. Uh, in the holiday spirits. Okay. Um I'm going to do a real quick a two haiku and a sonnet. Um, should be under three minutes here. <clears throat> Blinking Christmas lights, heart beating from home to home, red through this year's mist. 
Santa's shopping cart ringing new bells. Over Christmas commercials in my car, I saw another much top like tree with star. Atop Santa was pushing a shopping cart against the highway winds, he was most stalwart. Now between Walmart and homes in this valley, quite low is the median household salary. With parents making minimum wages, yet Amazon now the Sears wish book pages. Christmas comes and goes, but credit debt stays until the kid's debt takes on the parent's debt's place. Still the car forges ahead like a good sleigh, but perhaps with a message put on display. We want out of this cycle, but we'll say, okay, besides all of the cars are heading this way. And uh, we'll wind down here with the poems shared aloud, words jingling through the clouds. We share a sleigh ride. Oh, thank you guys. It's been a pleasure this year. Thank you to Sandy and, um, and Dawn and Elizabeth and thank you to all the poets here. It's been great. Thank you so much, Gail, Melody, Indron. And we move forward uh, into the new year with more poetry. We look forward to hearing you next time. Our next, my next special guest is joining us today from Kolkata, Archana Sani. And what I want to say about Archana is, um, Again, Archie is one of those folks who reached out to me. We had a robust convert. We've had robust conversations over Zoom and email, and we've showed up in different readings. And uh, the fabulous, fabulous thing that I remember, if you were here for the open mic, which was Archna's debut with us, she talked about. She was the first reader that day because it's very, very early in the morning in India. She talked about the divine feminine and that opened up that, that it was like the floodgate of that reading and set this in, in just this incredible, incredible space for that reading that I've never forgotten that particular open mic. I remember things about mostly every single reading, something, but that again, I really wanted to bring the divine feminine to our reading today. Um, acknowledge um, that extraordinary performance that you gave then and for all that you do um, in the poetry world as well, because you also are an organizer of events and hold an incredible space for poets around the world. Thank you, Archna. I'm so, I'm so honored to be uh, in poetry community with you to, and to call you my friend. Oh, Sandy, um, thank you so much for your kind words. Um, it feels wonderful to be back, you know, from August then to here, just lovely. And thank you so much again for this opportunity. And, um, and thanks to all the poets for their wonderful poetry. Um, I'm feeling kind of overwhelmed. <laughs> so let me see if I can bring the Defined Feminine in today. Um, I have about three poems and I'll just quickly begin. Um, I don't know if they're like, they have the festive spirit, but I'm going to read poems connected to love somehow. And all are like unpublished. So, so your CV Live is going to be publishing them. Okay, so this one is called um, There Was Never Two. There was never two. I was nothing. There was only you and you. When you looked into the swirling river, I was the writing on it that you could not read. When you opened the window, I was the breeze that brushed your face, ruffled your curtains, then fell silent to the floor. In my dream last night, when you walked amongst the flowers of Pampur, I was the opening bud your hand almost touched. Will your lips ever meet my lips? So what if you were born much before my time? The universe chose my body and yours to reveal love's alchemy. I did not ask, I did not ask you how you feel about me. I had my answer when your eyes met mine. 
What you call the asura inside of you is for me the stirrings of the divine love. There are no contraries in love. When we embrace our bed will become an altar of flame, turning everything we are and do from gross to sublime. Will your lips ever meet mine? Come love, we are running out of time. Read the writing on the swirling water. Drink me with your eyes. Make me real with a kiss. Okay. My next poem is called Aditi. Aditi is a goddess in, um, in the Vedas in ancient Indian scriptures. She's also, she, she means, she means um, space, just the holder of space. In fact, everything, infinity. Aditi. So this poem is about hope. Um, only the unborn ones like you can be the face of hope. Come to me as my daughter that could not be. Enter my womb as my mother or father or be both. Aditi, you are the holder of space, especially the space between the two continents I inhabit. You are the deepest secret. You are the hope beyond death. Infinite and deep is the terrain of my desire. Only you can contain me. As I never wish to end, come to me as immortality. You are the hope beyond death, the beginning after the illusion of an ending. You are the one I seek. You are the seed that will awaken the field of possibilities. You are the ferment that leads to form. You are the shape of desire, the quickening pulse behind every storm. You are about to be born. So um, I think I have time for um, one short. This one is called Destiny. You are the prayer flowing back between my folded hands, the kiss lost in the mist, finding its way back on my lips. I am drawn to you as an incarnated heart is drawn to the thorn of destiny carrying in it a single wish made lifetimes ago. So thank you. Thank you, Sandy and Elizabeth. All right, Sinead. Hi, everybody. It's my first time on Cultivating Voices. I'm glad I got it in just before the end of 2020. Beautiful to hear everybody reading. It's really special. Um, I'm going to read one poem. It was published earlier in the summer. By the way, I'm reading from uh, Sligo in the northwest of Ireland. It was published on Poet Head um, in July of this year, and it's called Space Taxi. Soon I'll be able to hail an Uber to Mars. Well, not hail exactly. I will inform my driver. I'm waiting on the corner at Kilty Tig beside the tall green house. I'll be there early before the postman does his rounds, watching the heron fly over and the grey wagtail dance in the river. Then Uber can deliver me to the launch pad just off the bog road in Boyle, as good a place as any, well known for its UFOs. By then we'll all be flying everywhere anyway. One more liftoff will hardly be noticed. Maybe someone out footing turf will remark on the plumes of smoke coughing across the fields towards them. Wonder why the slows have fallen off the black thorn or the fallow deer are galloping their way. But they'll get used to the daily flights and laugh like the rest of us at the irony of no bus route to Boyle, but a shuttle to Mars. When I'm strapped in, sucking my Simpkins travel sweets, hurtling towards the blue sky, Mrs. Higgins will lean across and ask, why are the windows so small or do you think there'll be tea? 
and I will smile and nod and grit my teeth as the capsule separates with one neat shudder and outside cuts from blue to nothingness with stars. Soon there'll be queues on the bog road to boil for the SpaceX Express to Mars. And the English couple in Clun Lu will sell their farm fresh eggs and raw honey. Mrs. Tansy from Breachla will tout her box tea. And young Welsh will sell space rock with Nocatelli running through it in red sugar leading. By then I'll have forgotten all about my trip to Mars and my re-entry with a splash at the mouth of the Garavogue and waiting in the northwest rain for the train to Ballymoat because I couldn't get a bus from Sligo back to the corner in Kilty Tyke when I could get an Uber to Mars. Thanks. Catherine, can you unmute yourself? Oh, there you go. Am I unmuted? Okay. Um, I am in Cold Spring, New York on the Hudson River and say thanks to Sandy, Dawn and Elizabeth. This is my first time at Cultivating Voices as well. Um, I am reading a poem called Nativity Tales. Same story told twice uh, by two different voices. We women heard a story so sad, so strange about a young mother to be. She'd just come of age when told from on high like old Sarah before her of a miracle son she'd conceive. Her angel departed and when her time came, she was forced to travel without mother, sisters, or any other female kin, with only a husband who was not the child's father. The Lord sent a star as a guide, but to a town that held nothing she needed, not one room, one woman like us to help her with warm oiled hands and a voice to tell her, push, you and your boy will live. She had only that untrained man, an ass and some cows, all silently watching that star's silent light shine till baby was come. A while later, three more men brought gifts, costly, magnificent, nothing they needed. And the second voice, no one ever asked so I never told, but for the record, I did not bring forth in pain like other women, nor was I helpless in that stable. Only the star that watched over me knows. The Holy Ghost was my midwife and God my partner on the ride. Fused into one, we surfed tsunamis, shot through volcanoes, sang praise with all earth's flowers. We entered the sun's holy center as pilgrims and loved until God, our father, was ready to bring himself forth as our son and shine in my arms. It was all joy. The pain came later. And after that, heaven. Thank you so much, Catherine. Thank you, Sinead. Both of you joining us for the first time. We hope it won't be the last. Come on back in the new year. Beautiful to hear your voices today. Well, my next special guest is another one of those poets that joined us very early on in the first couple of weeks and is, was one of the first poets to join us from Ireland, actually. Fergus Hogan is a poet of conscience and self-consciousness. I love that combination um, in his work, in his words, how he delivers the poem. And he's also given some of the most 
melodious lyrical readings that we had heard in those early weeks of cultivating voices and anytime he's able to join us we're so very very glad to have you come to us joining us from waterford ireland um that country that's a beacon of poetry to so many of us certainly to me as a person who's published in ireland um, i feel that affinity Again, uh, another person that I'm so grateful to know through our group here. There's so many of you I would never, I, I would never have met, and I can't imagine not knowing you. So thank you, Fergus, for being one of those of many, many people, and and representing cultivating voices today. Uh, Sandy, for a meal of a DE for Portugal there, not a ditch. Happy Christmas, friends, and, and Sandy and Liz, thanks for introducing us. I'd like to, I'd like to try a poem off the page tonight, um, spoken word poem. Um, it's called The Sin Eater. And I think most of you guys would know uh, Thomas Lynch's poetry from Salmon, The Sin Eater. I suppose before the Catholics came and took over our country, we needed sin eaters, that when we would die, they would sit by our side and they would take our sins on board so we could be set free. And I think I need a sinister very often in my life. And this poem is dedicated to my friend, Tom Connors. And the Irish people will know that the name Connors is one of the family names of the traveling, the bardic, the nomadic people. It's Christmas Eve, babe, in the drunk town. An old man said to me, won't see another one. And then he sang a song. The dear old mountain Jew. I turned my head away. And dreamed about you. There's a certain kind of light that falls on Christmas Eve. Unlike any other night of the year. A sort of winter solstice shadow that creeps across the sky and lifts the light back out of the dark. A quiet type of light that only some can see as the shopkeepers come out of the shops and pull the shutters down and chase the last of the late night shoppers home. Too late. And so voices of the last Christmas songs dwindled away down side streets and drunken alleyways and I follow them, looking for company in all the wrong places. And an old drunk is tossed out from a side door, singing too loud. You scumbag, you maggot, you cheap bloody. <laughs> Happy Christmas, me arse. I'm glad it's our last. Ho, 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 now fuck off home, he says to me. And I wonder if he knows the truth of my story by the look of my eye or my gait. And when I get home, the house is cold and dark, but I don't bother to light the fire or to keep a switch on. Instead, I open a bottle and sit down and drink it alone again. And as I'm falling asleep, I dream I'm a child again back home in my nana's kitchen and the two of us are doing our Christmas Eve chores. I'm polishing the shoes, sparkling black, lining them up at the back door, ready for the early morning mass and nana is peeling the Brussels sprouts. I watch as she cuts the cross of Christ into the foot of each and every one, and she says it helps them cook clean through. And then she whispers, come on, it's time to light the Christmas candle. And as she lights the candle, she says the light tonight is to let the stranger within and the stranger without know there's a welcome at her door. And so I get up and I light the candle in the window. And as I do, I know that Christ himself went back upon this door tonight. I know that Joseph leading the donkey with his pregnant teenage girlfriend sitting on top might knock on this door tonight, begging for a bed for the cute birth. I know that the stranger in my heart might knock on my door and ask for faith and forgiveness. So when the knock on the door comes, I'm not surprised at all. But when I go out, I see it could be Santa Claus himself standing there before me with his long white beard and his curly black hair his disheveled old face, the wonder and how tramp breaking his journey at my door tonight. And I must have misunderstood him. I said, hang on, wait there, I'll see what I have. And when I came back, I crossed his palm with silver, and he repeated himself and said, 
Is there anything I can do for you this night? And I looked in his eyes and I said, yes. Would you hear my confession? And he took my hands in his and he said, I will. Oh, Father, forgive me for I have sinned. It's 35 years since my last confession. I've sinned against God and man and myself. And he said, stop with that theological sort of bullshit and just tell me the truth of what you've done wrong. I said, I fucked a woman who wasn't my girlfriend and I broke my girlfriend's heart and her trust. And he held me in his arms as I wept until I sobbed myself silent. And he asked, have you apologized yet to both of the ladies? And I said, I did. And he looked up into the sky and saw the star hanging from heaven and said, as true as God is my witness, you are forgiven tonight. Mary and Joseph and baby Jesus too forgive you this night for they can see the sadness in their soul. And then he looked across my shoulder and said, who made the wreath on your Christmas floor? And I gave him your name and he said, it's a sign. I think she's beginning to forgive you. Now you must pray for grace and begin to forgive yourself. For if you don't, you'll never let love back into your soul. And he kissed me on both of my cheeks and wiped away my tears with his hair. And I watched him wander back into the night and I closed the door behind him. And I swear to God I could hear a choir of angels singing and sleigh bells in the sky. But I realized all of this is true. And the boys in the NYPD choir were singing, and all were they, and the bells were ringing out for Christmas Day. I love you, darling. Happy Christmas, friend. So moving on with Sandy Elizabeth. Thank you. all right bertha you're up thank you for hey thanks again sandy for you and elizabeth for doing this i've been part of it a lot and it's wonderful fun uh, and i love hearing everybody read today i'm going to read a poem called the most favored one all that morning the sky dark heavy as a heathen carpet cast shadows on the land there was an interminable stirring at the doorway, a cloying sweet odor, and the angel was everywhere in her chamber, taking up the air. Mary was breathless, she fainted. His wings, when she could see, were feathered in sun and rain, riffled by the warm wind. His eyes were terrible, so blinding she raised her hands to hide, but her palms were embossed with the faces of angels. Mary, Mary, the Lord is with you. She thought she heard the bells of distant camels, but his voice rang deeper than bells. It resounded, struck at the center of the earth, striking at her heart. The room was full of music. And everything that had gone before was nothing. There was only this unspeakable, pure knowing she was the chosen, the goddess. She was a river flowing from heaven to earth. The angel said, Mary. Afterwards, she couldn't remember him. His body swelled, her body swelled, and she went inside it to listen to the child. When she gave birth, she was as calm as an animal. At the moment of his death, the sky went black. The whole earth struggled and shrank to stillness. They lowered him like any man from the cross tree. Here is your son. Pierced to her heart, Mary removed the cloth from her head. She laid it over his shoulders. She held his body for an eternity. Thank you. Teresa, thank you, Bertha. Mm -hmm. Teresa's up next. 
Hi, thank you so much, Sandy, for this opportunity. And thank you to all you wonderful people who are listening out there today. I feel so blessed by this pandemic at one level. And that is I've had the opportunity to meet so many wonderful poets across the United States and particularly across the pond. So many wonderful Irish and United Kingdom poets. Thank you so much. I'm gonna read a poem from my new book that just came out, it's called The Scent of Love and the title poem, Scent of Love. You look at me and penetrate my heart. Now I am a prisoner of your words teasing me at every level of my being. My thoughts are obsessed with the idea of your love. I undress in my dreams and fall into your embrace. When I wake up, I stroke the image rubbing my heart. I ache for your presence to touch on the earth plane. Then sadness bursts my chest wide open, floods my body with water, with water of pain. You will not see this nor feel this. You are only in my mind. As the warmth of you fades into morning, reality sucks my blood. I cry alone in the physical, totally protected by the sacred fragrances. I want to go back to my dreams where my soul may engage the everlasting scent. So I close my eyes, embraced in spiritual light and awaken to the scent of love. Thank you again so much. Thank you, Teresa. And Teresa will be uh, joining us next year in the new year with a new book showcase reading from the scent of love. Thank you. Thank you, Bertha. Thank you, Fergus. And we're near, we're a little over the top of the hour. So I just want to come in and say you're listening to Cultivating Voices live poetry, our hope, po oh, holiday poetry open house with poets who are our members from literally around the globe today in celebrating poetry and this season of light that we're in and the togetherness that we have cultivated through this group over the pandemic since we started on March 29th with our first of 39 consecutive Sundays of readings. 39's the charm, my friends, and here we are. Well, next we go to New Zealand and we're going to hear from Rachel Gomez. I am, again, Rachel was one of those poets that reached out to me when I was still in Montana. Remember in those early weeks, I was actually, we were actually going live from Montana, the living room of Anita Rognes and her, my friend Liza Rognes, her mom let us do this week after week for two months in her living room. It started in Missoula, Montana. And then when we moved back to Washington, we started broadcasting from my kitchen. And now I'm here in my childhood bedroom in Old Sabre, Connecticut, um, where uh, I'll be through January. So not just in my bedroom, I'll, I'll, I'll get a little out of, I'll get to go in other places of the house too. Anyway, Rachel contacted me over the private message to inquire about how to read on Cultivating Voices and particularly how to connect given that her time zone, when we're doing signups and when we're um, reading, because then back then we were reading at three o'clock Pacific, which meant it was very late even in Ireland. So we made the adjustments and we did every other week. So it was more hospitable to folks in different time zones. It was not very hospitable to Rachel, but she came on at five o'clock in the morning, I believe. That, that first time she read. And 
I, it was it was literally I heard music to my ears, incredible reading, and I thought, how lucky were we to attract such an accomplished poet, published poet from New Zealand? Wow, what are the chances in those early weeks? And only to find out that Rachel was just trying to find a place to connect with other poets. And it wasn't about books and publications and all of that. It was pure poetry. And honestly, her poetry to me represents that, pure poetry. I am so glad you're able to join us today, Rachel. And um, thank you so much for everything. It's been a pleasure to get to know you. And after, and after Rachel in the open mic will be Linda Olson Graham. Kia ora, kia ora from New Zealand. Naha mehe. Um, thank you so much, Sandy, Carol, and Don, everybody for, for joining us. It's, it's been an honor and an absolute pleasure to be a part of this group and um, to find a voice and find so many other voices. Uh, my first poem um, is called The Water Children, and I dedicate this really to New Zealand and the position that we are in, and to give a little piece of New Zealand um, and the beauty that we are still able to experience at the moment, which I'm really grateful for. This is called The Water Children. We are the whale riders born of tooth and bone. At the water's edge, our flesh meets brine. In absolution, we float, buoyed by the hands of phosphorescent ancestors. We are the whale riders, born of tooth and bone, root and stem, truth and betrayal. Immersed in liquid cradle, as though anchored to umbilical mater, raised in colonies like seaweed, as though anchored, that strums and skirts flesh, jade green, brown, and rust red bloodlines. The tide counts our breaths in and out. The moon waits to tell all. This one is um, a walk in Oriental Parade, which is a beautiful, beautiful place in Wellington, our capital. And it's a place I like to go to think, and it's been a beautiful spot um, during this pandemic. I rely on the verdant green land, a constant in this ever-changing world, shrub and scrub entangled in chaotic harmony, houses jutting from hip-bearing hills, climbing the tracks woven into the bay, overhead branches lean towards still harbour, Twisted ligneous fingers extending as leaves sway propositioned by the rush hour of a northerly wind. Solid roots birth these majestic trees, gracious, gracious native hosts, stoic keepers of internal blistering heat, winter's folly. Below orcas hunt in the sea of opportunity, Skimming the mirrored glass, harboring today's less fortunate stingrays. The city breathes in and out, and the lungs of tomorrow prepare to welcome us with new joys. Yesterday's sorrows spent, buried beneath glint of golden sand and determined souls. And the last poem I would like to read is dedicated to um, many people who live in lockdown for. for well, every day. And um, New Zealand has a disproportionate number of um, people who are going through domestic violence. And recently in our hometown uh, where I live in Carterton, New Zealand, there were 133 white ribbons placed outside the local library. And that was for just the number of reported cases of domestic violence. And so I think at this time of the year, we can look at how fortunate we all are and remember those who are not, and perhaps to give a voice to those who cannot 
voice their own. A God boy existence. A God boy existence. In suburbia, she found herself pulled up by the throat, gasping for air. The weekends were slippery rocks, particularly treacherous waters, full of attempts to avoid his hook, which would come out of nowhere, leave her utterly hollow. It wasn't the lure he'd cast back when they first met. She, a fluid silhouette, glinting skin on the surface of a fertile river, purposely moving upstream when he reeled her in. Inside the netted perimeters, he guts her with every blackened word. It was a different kind of breathless ones. Thank you. Bravo, Rachel. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you and so much. Linda Olson Graham is next on the open mic. Oh, hi, everybody. Sandy, Elizabeth, and Don, thank you so much. It's just lovely to be here with everybody in here, what every, everyone is sharing. And I wish everyone a safe and healthy holiday with what's going on in the world. So my writing is under the name Earth, Ocean, Heavens. Um, I have a book online. It's And one of the sites is earthoceanheavens.com. Um, there's poetry and a lot of photographs of the Caribbean, I sailed years ago and a lot of photographs of faraway places. So um, I'll read from, I take notes um, when I hear talks and um, very often, I mean, it boils down, this person probably spoke for 20 minutes and the talk was um, in Northeast Un Northeastern University's sacred space. How sweet is silence having quiet mind. Thomas More, Care of the Soul. Odyssey, we try to make our way through life, trying to find a place to call home. Gnostics tell of the life health of the soul. Buddha was born 25, 26,000 years ago. Until age 29, he did not know sickness, old age, death. At 29, he encountered them. There's a point in each of our lives where we move from our palatial Eden out into the world. Suffering has been used as a start for the path. There's a time when one is confronted with things as they are and one holds one's vision. That is responding to the whispers before they become shouts. When large things happen, example, September 11th, we need time to absorb the shock self-nurture, settle in the self, be not too ambitious to move away from shock. The first noble truth regarding suffering, honor it, spend time with it. Buddha studied under a tree and absorbed the teachings. We need to take information in when we sit under a tree and absorb it. In the Zen, in the tradition of Zen teachings, we need to osmotically absorb the great way is not difficult if there's no picking and choosing. Dharma is the way things are. Be present enough not to deny our reality as it is. Reality is our teacher. Events are our teacher. Thank you so much. I'm honored to be here with all of you. Thanks a million. Thank you, Linda. Sure. Blessings. And again, Linda is the Colorado Poet Peace Laureate. I like to point that out. Yeah, uh, and a Peace Poet Laureate. Yeah, Peace Poet Laureate. Yeah. Uh, thank yeah. you. Yeah. And we, my next special, I also want to say about Linda. Linda, again, was one of those folks that joined us early in the series. And, um, was going live to Facebook directly. This was pre-Zoom. So again, I'm grateful for those voices that we're hearing from today that were with us in those early weeks, now 39 weeks later. 
Thank you so much. Uh, you all know who you are. <laughs> you all know who you are because you went through those tutorials to do that. <laughs> and you remember what it was like. Well, a poet who fortunately did not have to go through that is my next special guest, which is Angela Driven. Angela, this is what I would like to say about Angela. It is for me incredibly exciting when I hear a poet that I haven't heard read before and the first words out of their mouth, my jaw drops. That Angela for the first time. I believe reading in our Nasty Women special anthology reading, if I'm getting that wrong, my apologies. It was either that or our Lily Ledbetter, but I think it was the Nasty Women reading. First of all, thanks to those editors who also um, brought their anthologies as special events to Cultivating Voices. We have had, um, We've, we've had Longleaf Press. We've had Headmistress Press was one of our presses that sponsored the Poetry Pride Parade. Uh, we've had the, the, the wonderful Lost Horse Press where we had the anthology of, where we had the anthology of Nasty Women and also the Raising Lily Ledbetter reading that we had here that celebrating on Labor Day in the US, um, uh, women occupying the workspace. These really special events that the editors go to trouble to help me organize and bring you an entire, entire catalog of poets um, as like we're doing today. And Angela was one of those poets that I got to hear in one of those anthology readings and glad then that she joined Cultivating Voices and has been a really wonderful driving force here. I've also, I, so I look for every opportunity to hear her read and today, is one of those days I get to hear her read. And thankfully we won't have to wait longer, too long because her new book is coming out soon in 2021. And she'll be in a new book showcase in April with Grace Bauer, who was the editor, co-editor of that Nasty Women anthology of subversive verse. Grace Bauer, Jules Nyquist, and Denise Duhamel will be reading with Angela. So welcome, Angela. Thanks so much. Happy holidays. Thank you. And Phil Lynch Thank and Ann McDonald will be on the open mic after. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Sandy. I feel so. Uh, I can't even believe I'm I'm here. I always think you're going to realize you made a mistake by inviting me. <laughs> so, um, Praise this year, the veils began to lift. Praise John Prine, may we all have more balls than a big brass monkey. Praise Charlie Pride, now the ghost of what was once a man. Let us see the sun, let this darkness in. Praise the evening purple iris balled up like a fist on my mama's kitchen counter. Praise Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, Ahmaud Aubrey, Vincent Harris, Tina Marie Davis, Ryan Sims, Jonas Joseph. Praise 164 Black people dead at the hands of police in the first eight months of this year. When I say praise, I mean grieve. When I say praise, I mean change. When I say praise, I mean surely we won't let this be unseen. Praise a president who doesn't grab women's pussies, but lifts them up and calls her doctor, Secretary of Housing and Urban Development, Secretary of Energy, Secretary of the Interior. Praise Kamala Harris. Praise women in all places where decisions are being made. Praise RBG. When I say praise, I mean gratitude for this year of shock events when we all stayed home and watched the news Praise those of us who are seeing for the first time, those of us who were finally seen. Praise the nights of halved moons and stars many, this year's blue harvest moon and her moon of Gemini. Praise the screech owl's lament, such mourning from such diminutive body. Praise the softness of a child's skin before it endures. 
Praise the loves that hit my tongue like pop rocks and sweet tarts. Praise screaming busted flat and Baton Rouge windows down as though I sound good. Praise the stranger who named me beautiful. Praise the box of rain. No one knows who put it there. Praise the boy fathered by a man with a closed fist, no way for a son to get in or out. Praise the mothers who beat their daughters, tell us we weren't worth a shit just like them and teach us to read. Praise the smell of cut grass and yard onions and the way they bind to remind of summer swimming and dancing and broomsticks down by the river. Praise the lizard in the driveway dead after another storm so green he looks alive. Praise the whale's earwax and the way it tells us of all we do to harm the sea. Praise those of us who recycle and cannot accept that our plastic is not changing shape at all. Praise the beloveds whose names we will never be blessed enough to taste on our lips again. Praise the elderly who sat alone for a year without visitors. Praise those who remembered to call. Praise the blues of the bird who visits me in the dead of December. Feathers so vibrant, they name a new blue, bluer than ocean or sky or Kool-Aid. So blue, I know they are not of this earth. This is one of my people. Bones of my bones, flesh of my flesh, come to tell me I must praise. I must praise for all that has been given because I can still breathe. Praise the distance that has been bridged by pixelated squares. Praise the way my dog teaches me to rest when the rain falls so I will be ready to run when the sun comes. Praise Bubba Wallace for tearing down that bag. Praise those of us whose backs are strong enough to own up to the shame. Ask forgiveness, be part of a warmer light. Praise a lover who still wants to make it even after you poof a toot. Praise the levity and human fallibility. Praise my sister who won't wear a mask, my stepfather who is scared to die, and my mother who needs them both desperately. Praise the ginkgo tree who throws down all her hearts at once. Praise the ignorance used as a tool against the ignorant. May we never hear proud and boys in the same sentence again. Praise the year we remembered to cry when ordinary people die. Praise the time of day when wavelengths lengthen, when spectral waves turn from white light to shades of candled pumpkins. Praise the base of Tennessee rain on the windshield, the dog barking at the buffalo statue. The terror feels the same for every species, and this year may be the year we accept the gravity of that. Praise the kettle screaming because it means chamomile and jasmine and rose hips. Dreams are coming. Praise not knowing if you're dazzled by the courts or the light passing through it. Praise knowing you don't know. Praise the place on me that aches most for peace, the blue of my throat, the holler of truth. Praise the skin, the boundary, the cloak, a deceit for the spirit. Praise the morning after sweet smolder of a fire both people wanted to burn. All the lonely Ferris wheels and roller coasters and log flumes waiting for us. All the chain stokes echoing throughout the year. I don't care who you get on your knees to, who your heart lifts out to when you bend your back. When I say praise 2020, I mean, let this be the year we change. Let veils lift, let us see ourselves, let us not settle for less, let us be more, do more, know better, live best. Let us not put all our hopes and dreams on the shoulders of a new year. She is tired of being burdened by our lazy hope. Praise 2021, knowing it is up to us. Thank you. As you see, my mic is was unmuted and sometimes I take a pause. This was one of those moments that I take a pause. Yeah.
And I hope you'll have no doubt about what I said about you earlier. And you'll see it in the chat, Angela. You're always welcome. There's never a doubt. Never a doubt. Next on the open mic, we have Phil Lynch and Ann McDonald. Thank you, Sandy and crew. Hi, everyone. Um, that was amazing. I think, could we just declare 2020 over at that point? Uh, anyway, I have a short poem for you. Um, it's not a Christmas poem, but it does refer to Christmas. So it's my annual excuse to give it a twirl. Um, that brief background, it goes back about 30 years to the first Gulf War when all the talk over that particular Christmas was of the inevitability of a war uh, without any talk of how it might be avoided or any other strategy. Um, I was living in Belgium at the time and uh, supermarket shelves were being rationed uh, within 24 hours because of the fear that this would um, flow over in, in Gulf Europe as well. So um, there's a, yeah, so it's, it, it's called Christmas present, as I say, it's, it's um, not a Christmas poem, but it can be if you want it to be. It's not, uh, it can be for any war as well. So um, there's a, starts with an epigraph from um, Norman Schwarzkopf, who was a US general at the time, who said, it doesn't take a hero to order men into battle. It takes a hero to be one of those men who goes into battle. I wanted to get you a poem for Christmas but the poem shop was all sold out. I asked the assistant behind the counter if he knew what it was all about. He said there had been a run on poems. People were buying them up in tomes. Something to do with the talk of war. Everyone seemed to be lost for words. It was panic buying and nothing else, hoarding and hiding on secret shelves. There might even be rationing, the assistant said. A few lines at a time, even they may not rhyme. Will it matter, I thought, to the dead? It is onward now as we watch the clock, a time bomb ticking away. Soldiers waiting to go over the top, no, not the hour, nor the day. Is it onward now and over the top, down into an unmarked grave? Or will someone give the order to stop? Is there anyone still? so brave. Thanks. Have a happy, peaceful, and safe festive season, folks. Thank you. Thank you, Phil, and hello, Anne. Hi, Sandy. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, okay. Um, thank you so very much. I thought I was going to have a heart attack listening to Angela's amazing poem. Um, it's unbelievable. Uh, so many unbelievable poems tonight. And um, I started this year not knowing any of you, not having met anybody. And it's fantastic to see so many familiar faces and so many new faces. And big, huge thank you to you and Elizabeth Ann for creating this seriously global event amazing thing to do thank you so much um i also started this year with my father being very much the center of our, our family and um uh, sadly he was taken from us in the cruelest of circumstances in a nursing home in the middle of covid on the 4th of august um but i wrote one of the things that he loved was um he, did, he had a great sense of his own worth and his own value and the grandchildren called him a legend because he had his first heart attack at 32 he didn't die until he was 91 and he had many times in between um but he wanted a handmade suit he loved he was off that era where he got handmade suits made for occasions and the last one he wanted was air force blue that color and the tailors told him that it, it wasn't the color and he said it was because it was good enough for Elvis and Tony Blair, so it would be good enough for him. And, um, and they eventually found him Air Force Blue. So when I wrote this poem, it was the day after he died on the 5th of August, and I never in my wildest dreams would have believed that I would be 
reading this poem to you now from his house, um, which is where I grew up, uh, two or three fields away from here. Um, so it's kind of come full circle and it's a deep, deep honor to be able to share it with you. His birthday was yesterday. So um, if I can do this without crying, it'll be a miracle. I found his passport yesterday that he got and he never went anywhere, but he got a new passport. So it's called Air Force Blue and it's dedicated to Eamon Faulkner, my father. It's a rare and special gift to stay forever proud of who you are and where it is you came from. To live all your days near familiar roads and fields and to know the branch of every tree, the notes of every bird's song. To embrace the new and yet hold dear the memories of those you loved and knew. To walk those same familiar roads before you. To recall the way that things were done when you were young and to pass those stories down, each one a special treasure, one by one. It's a rare and special man who stays forever proud of how his family grew and we always knew how much you cherished people close around you. And it's not many men can cut a dash in Air Force Blue. It's a rare and special life that's lived to the last full and true. And although your time with us has passed, your legacy will live as a man who had so much to share and much to give. For that we say, Cape Wheel of Weakus, Eamon. Colossavastor, Colossavastor, Colossavastor Mokri. Sleep easy now, a legend you to us will always be. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. Um, yeah, thank you so much and sorry for your loss and happy birthday to your dad. Um, I'm also in my childhood home, in my bedroom. My mom and dad are downstairs, so uh, there. Could I just add one more um, really special thing that happened this week in the middle of such a sad event? We never dreamt we would ever move to this house ever. And we moved in on, I think, Wednesday. And the very first piece of post was the wonderful Fergus Hogan's Bitter and Cry Poetry Collection. Very first post we got. So that was just so gorgeous. Thank you, Fergus. <laughs> you know, that gives me pause to also say another joy for me during this year has been receiving all your books in the mail, whether they came to me in Montana, in Olympia, and I've been getting some here in Old Saybrook, Connecticut. I've loved, I've loved the exchange. So thank you so much. And um, yeah, here's to your new home, Anne. And it holds a lot of sacredness as well. All right, next. Is a person I knew before the pandemic whose poetry I truly, truly respect, admire, and in addition, but in a, and in addition to Gary Lilly's brilliant, sublime, and moving poetry, Gary really brought a lot of integrity to this group when he joined. Um, and in the first couple weeks, um, as we were like continuing to develop the reading series, he added a provocative necessary post. And again, it was one of these moments in the history of these 39 weeks that I want to bring forward because all of these moments are significant to how we continue to move forward. And he wrote, he wrote simply five words, which were, where are the black writers? It had prompted in a conversation with Gary that we, that I continue to have with myself. And um, as we develop cultivating voices, because we truly seek to bring voices forward towards social justice, 
Garrett, to the best of my ability, I heard you. I will keep working. And I want to thank all the poets who have stepped up, who have felt voiceless and unheard because of some insidious identity politic that had kept them silent before or unseen. And I'm grateful to all of you who have stepped forward and shared your voice. We had many, we, we've had a number of folks, I wanna remind you of April Lee Fields, Tamara J. Madison, Lauren Russell's reading. If you did not see Lauren Russell's new book showcase, please look at her video who offered just really memorable performances. And uh, we look forward to more voice in the new year. Uh, I'll bring, uh, remind us, Teresa, right here with us today, new book coming out, new book showcase reading from that scent of love. I love that book. Gary is much sought after to read and always welcome here. And I'm so glad he's joining us today because I know so many of you have all, always, always talk about how much you love to hear Gary Lilly. Thank you, Gary. Thank you, Sandy, for like your vision and uh, and the strength to sustain this vision that you have. I really appreciate it to be reading of all these poets and you know week after week that that's all you have. So I mean, it's it's just great. I'm gonna start with uh with Asheville. I'm gonna read two poems. Homeless angels sing in the city, in the mountain hollows and evergreens. North Carolina, land of the slave drive, Highway 40 through the home of the brave. Thomas Wolf and O. Henry, but ain't no monuments for anybody Cherokee, except at the cigar store. Well, let me stop and catch my breath. Gotta cut out smoking these damn cigarettes and dropping my butt in Asheville. Screw the pop guns, damn the magnum, the hollow point loaded American cannon. I got Jean, the dog-eared pages of Gene Tumor, the whole revolution, the black arts movement. I mixed them together and work it like a potion. So come on now, put me to the test. I'll bust the poem to my last cigarette. Down Highway 40 off the bypass. Low hourly wage at the textile mill. 300 miles from my family. Ain't none of us crazy handling snakes. The misdemeanors and the felonies teachers, hustlers, lawyers, and ministers, this colorful wave of saints and sinners. Get together on the holidays and drink and smoke and deal the cost. Jesus saves a backwood church and a cemetery, libations at the graves of our ancestors. And, um, and and this is a poem that I had an earlier draft that that I, that I read up here. <laughs> Thank you, Sandy. <laughs> um, and so now this is uh, this is the latest version of this draft. I hope it's the final version. Um, the Book of Distorted Psalms. When the gospel hour of the dog becomes the time of the wolf, and red howls arc across the lonesome valley and shadows fade a desperate night in the liquor houses, in restaurants serving factory folks, peanuts and pretzels on the bar, gamblers with loaded dice and mark decks, and long sedans cooling at the curb or at the table stacking their paper. You could ante up or pull a poem from the tomb of your pocket. Just don't say I told you so, but this is where fallen angels go. 
the smoke from the gypsy turn into tarot cards, the smoke thick as prayers that drift into her front room will turn the cars for customers waiting in wooden chairs to claim their turn as they drink from mason jars they have bought from home to pass the time as quietly as the ash that falls like dust from the burning tip of her cigar and the embers burning a hole in her tatted carpet as she crushes the cherry tip into the sole of her left shoe and the folks in her front room each alone who wait while her car while her cats lick one another in the face the gypsy's front room is crowded and the hoodoo seeps into the tired town that sleeps believing nothing magical ever happens as holy as their weekly resurrection and that will suffice at least until the rapture comes and the dead then empty from the graves to catch the blue line train to heaven and those who are left behind with their corporate jobs will be chain smoking in the back seats of cars rolling from red light to red light don't say i never told you so this is where the broken go this is how they go Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much, Gary. And as you're seeing the seeing the responses in the chat. Thank you. Well, next, joining us from Germany is Sven Kreitschmar, followed by Marian Lovett, or as I said, Sligo is well represented today in Ireland. Thank you. Yeah, hello, good evening, everyone. And uh, thank you, Sandy, for inviting me again. It's great to be here and um, great to listen to all your wonderful poems. Um, my one is actually based um, in my home area here, it's, it's Saarland, the smallest um, state of, of Germany. And um, it's uh, rather well known for, for steel production and also for coal mining. And my poem is called um, Elegy for the Steel Workers. It was just uh, published the other day in um, by UCD Press and the anthology, um, an anthology uh, Hold Open the Door. I think it's also available from their website now. Um, and it's um, based on um, or inspired by the um, the, the uh, Irish poet Francis Harvey. So, elegy for the steel workers. White burning fire snakes hiss out of the darkness into the half gloom of the rolling mill. The workers barely blink. Dark fumes hang under a concrete factory ceiling. Smell of sinter, steel dust and sweat evaporates. On slow shifts, they swap trivia, toil, wait for the changeover. Drink and smoke harden them, and when they talk, it is harsh, with a coarse humour about those who went through the factory gate, those on whom the umbrage of the hillsides fell. Their hardship is penned in heat and shadow. Some hardly live to see their pension, and on their deathbed remember the line some were engraved on a dirty girder. Only the dead are out of their element. Thank you very much. Um, I think I'm audible. Okay, my screen's been doing something funny, but I kind of like the orange light, it's a bit festive, so that's good. Okay, I've got two poems. Um, the first one is called Things We Carry. Learning how to carry one is difficult when you're only seven and you've been put standing on a table in front of the blackboard before the entire class beside the looming nun who's wearing the large starched white wimple 
and she is holding your arm too tight and she is shouting and you are crying and hoping that the we that is about to flow down your leg from the sheer terror of it will not show through the white tights you are wearing underneath the short pleated navy skirt and the chalk up numbers are dancing up and down in front of your eyes and no you don't get it you don't get it at all at all because mostly you are terrified that the class will see the wet patch growing larger on your tights and knickers and afterwards in the schoolyard the torture will continue as the children gather round and taunt smelly pants smelly pants snails and lice and ants all dads in your smelly underpants Years later, your mother wonders why it is you've never been any good at maths. Scuppered at seven, from then on, no chance of a steady career in banking or finance. Okay, the other one is a bit lighter. Um, it's written for my parents. And Sandy, I think it's lovely that you're in your family home with your parents downstairs right now. That's actually, that's really beautiful because those of us whose parents are gone. Christmas is a time when we miss them. So this is called Christmas Fish. One year for Christmas, they gave me, their already adult child, a plastic fish. It was mounted on a kitschy piece of polished pine. And when you turned the key behind, it lit up. And the fish flapped and sang, have yourself a merry little Christmas. Let your heart be light. I didn't laugh. I thought it crass. I stashed it in the attic with the unwanted crystal glass. Out of sight, out of mind. And in the new year, the thrift shop got it. Now they're both gone. I wish I'd kept it that ridiculous flapping, singing plastic fish. Perhaps these days I'd see the humor in it. Realize they may be thought their po-faced, superior, sophisticated, ingrate of a daughter who never seemed to have the time to call home or chat for long or visit more than twice a year, who's, but whom they still loved oh so dearly, needed lighting up, to lighten up, maybe just a little bit. That's it, guys. <laughs> Sandy, a pleasure to be here. It just... I'm looking forward to 2021 and it's been such a privilege and so exciting to connect with so many of you. I feel like I've made new friends. So it was the highlight of 2020, which was not such a great year, but cultivating voice is definitely the high point. High point, I know so many of you would agree with me. Good night, guys. Thank you for joining us from Sligo. Of course, I remember that time we met in Ellis Diamond and I always talk about it. And I just want to say quickly, you look like fireworks. <laughs> it's kind of funny, isn't it? It's great. It's fantastic. <laughs> I and the I second that it just, you know, the, the gods do that. The universe does things like that. The universe provides sometimes when it, when we need it most. Thanks for the fireworks. Good night. Good night. Oh, I'm still here. I'm staying on. All right. Very good. Well, next we go back across the pond to Calgary, Alberta, Canada. I am a big fan of curling as those of you who are from Canada have had to hear me talk about with you personally, incessantly. Uh, <laughs> Canada is known for so much more than curling, however. And one of the things that Canada for me is known for now is Josephine Lore. Josephine has been again, one of those stalwart folks coming week after week after week, reading in a numerous open mics and supporting all the poets when they've read week after week. And so I could not imagine a holiday party where I would not honor that and thank you for being one of those people that's held, our, held the ground with me with, to support all of us during these 39 weeks. And after Josephine, 
will be Gerald Schwartz, Kate Wegerson, Madge O'Callaghan, and Liam Boyle on the open mic. Thank you very much. Um, it's an honor to be asked to read and share in such amazing company. Uh, and Sandy and, your, and Beth, Elizabeth Ann, everything that you've done to get this with Dawn's help is incredible. Um, poetry has been my antidote for COVID. Um, I live alone and, and having this community, this virtual community of, of poets to come to um, has just been incredible. Uh, a lot of my poems are dark, so I've spent the week thinking about the gifts and trying to cultivate the gratitude. So I'd like to share two new pieces and then I'll read a piece that's a few years old, which is a solstice poem. And I'm reading from my computer. <clears throat> the first one is about my growing up. La Nina Nanna, la vigilia di Natale, Christmas Eve. Gesuzzo bambineggio. That's what my nanna called the Christ child. And there's a Nina Nanna, a lullaby we sing to him in Sicilian. When the guitar came out, after the meatless Christmas Eve dinner, pasta and polpo, squid, we clean by peeling back translucent skin, expressing the dab of black ink. Gamberetti, shrimp, whose plasticky peel we score and split, removing the black tract. And Carduna, artichoke stalks dipped in egg and farina and fried in hot oil. And then platters of fruit and finocchio, like celery of sweet licorice. And cudarege, cookies baked with figs and almond and coffee. Then walnuts and chestnuts and chocolates, the decadence. And before the table was cleared for the playing of cards, in suits of swords and cups and clubs and suns, scupa, briscola, sette e mezzo, each of us yielding a shiny fistful of quarters and nickels and dimes. Before the mothers and the daughters carried dishes to the kitchen and filled the sinks in a chattering assembly of washing and rinsing, drying and putting away before fathers went to lay upon the couches, bellies full of dinner and glasses of red wine. Out came the guitar, a shapely woman's body, the color of burnt umber. My father's fine fingers tickling it to tune. Melodies he'd learned at the knee of his nanna, my nonna Bija, whom I'd met in her nineties. She'd milk her goat every day. Soon the guitar and he and my nana harmonized voices to the sound of steel string. We'd sing that lullaby for Gesuzzo Bambinetro and his mamma Maria, the Christ child born that night on a bed of humble straw. O oh, quel del cielo, la bella armonia, la nina Maria, la nina Gesù. Uh, my second piece was written this week in kind of a response to Margaret Addison's poetry. She's a Canadian poet uh, and I just learned about her in the last few weeks. This one is called Winter Flowers. Dusk is deeper in midwinter, the sky slipping from soft dove to shades of pigeon and flicker and deeper still to raven. The blink of winter planets crisp as the lights that ring the roof of houses otherwise engulfed by night. Silence, no enemy to solitude. They waltz in this COVID congelation, her cheek soft, his bristle, her hair scented, his rough hand secure in the small of her back while on the window pane frost etches winter flowers. And the last piece I wrote, I was invited to a solstice celebration a few winters back and I, I didn't actually know very much about what solstice means, um, but I did learn. <laughs> and this one is my solstice song. Bury me in ashes, bury me in bone, bury me in mountain land a thousand miles from home. Bury me the depth of my height, 
the width of my wonderment and want. Toss yellowed roses onto fresh dug mound. Let each poet stand and speak one simple syllable, unutterable truth. For I have lived my seasons each. Daffodil iris spring have splashed in summer lake. Worn crown of buttercup. Walked auburn carpet leaves under slate storm sky. I have, and now I've come into my winter. Each day shorter, each night deeper. And the air stings my cheek, burns my lung. So I retreat within walls of wood and stone, sit within fire's glow, pull the duvet close. Darkness, an invitation to dream, a sky full of stars, infinite possibility of night, memories, reveries, reflections, illuminations, circle growing smaller. It encompasses my skin, my soul, lodged within me deep, the husks of yesteryear, daughter, student, lover, au pair, wife, teacher, mother, poet, each adding to my soil. This winter though is not to be my last. My trunk has not withered. My roots run deep in rich brown ground. My branches still bear fruit and the secret of bee and blossom whispers yet within my ear. And in this moment, when the southern third basks in golden light, now is my star-filled night. Snow in moon's blue glow, wonder-filled reveries, muted hush. By embers glow do I take refuge. Seeds within will germinate again in the hummus of leaves cast petals dropped, and soon, oh soon, the axis will tilt, and we will journey closer to the face of the glorious sun. But until that moment comes, bury me in ashes, bury me in bone, bury me in mountain land, a thousand miles from home. Thank you very much. All right, we have a quartet coming up in the open mic. We begin with Gerald Schwartz. Greetings, G.E. Schwartz here from uh, upstate when the Hoven lands, the unceded lands in upstate New York. And um, my poem tonight um, is for my mentor and friend, uh, anniversary of his death this week is uh, John Montague, the Irish American poet um, who taught me so much. December is a time of ghosts. It's not a question of a belief in ghosts when you've been walking around with one strap to your back for as long as you can remember. When you remember nothing, but whatever the ghost thinks to whisper in your ear softly on eternal repeat. When you've lost in one of the most troubling places of your life, maybe for decades, confused by subtle shifts in the angles of situations, the wrath-like invisibility of all our others. When exit ramps have been replaced, by the endless grinding of teeth and solar waste. When that voice in your ear, like the infernal tour guide that it is, mumbles on about meetings and deadlines and committees and safe houses and bailiffs and picket lines. When you almost remember that those words and what those words mean. When you can almost smell the glue and the gasoline. And the voice in your ear is the 
system of lines and threads, a storm of dates and sad songs, and you can almost make out that language as it tells you the catastrophe is a landmine concealed in the spaces between moments, and that those spaces are endless and as bleak as the sound of a stop clock. And you remember living through those same moments two decades ago, dressed in a light trench coat, clutching a broken wing mirror, demanding that strangers read their faces and their systems in the cracks. And you can recognize that memory as Armageddon itself, as the moment when all the stop clocks start up again, an impossible syncopation, a new kind of darkness, a new kind of flame just outside of your sight, flickering there as December is a time of ghosts. Thank you so much. Yeah. Hello. We can hear you. Hello. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for the heads up. <laughs> I already have my list for ancient days. Holidays are so hard to let go of. December 26th is Boxing Day through January 6th, Epiphany. My birthday, January 4th, is Distaff Day, when the women could lay down their distaff, the spindle whirls of their weaving. One day was given to them. And so these many, many, many centuries years today we say remember her name she was awarded the courage to bear witness remember her name darnella fraser age 17 filmed and the courage to bear witness and report the death of George Floyd, remember her name. Now, my writing to Cultivating Voices. The Year of Cultivating Voices. At winter's end, Cultivating Voices emerged, gathering poets, Washington State to Ireland, friends from everywhere in between, growing in serendipitous ways, people unknown to each other, weaving a tapestry, drawing in one poet after another, gathered in warm welcome to join. This bridge of care along great rivers, waterways, streams to estuary, dwelling in cities, towns, along mountains, valleys, prairies and plains, ocean to ocean, seven continents, seven seas, seven sisters of Pleiades, now poets create as friends in the familiar family nest, connecting to each other wishes for best outcome. Now winter begins. Winter lands are laden with snow or battened down grasses woven, trees start winter's entrance. Her roots provide abundant shelter for burrowing critters, birds, and insects. The wind and chill of change we bundle in. The majestic evergreen symbolizes the hope for spring. We cut a small tree. We cull a small tree to decorate, to delight, and string lights to uplift tying sheaths of wheat, berries, and stems from our cuttings, feeding the birds of flight, greeting the new dawn, and our poetry 
to share. <laughs> yay, 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 yay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, let me stop. Wait. That's okay. You're good. Thank you so much, Kate. I have to come in because you wrote a poem for us. I think it's going to be our annual reading. Make sure you see the comments in the chat. Love to you. All righty, our open micers continue. Madge O'Callaghan, thank you for being with us. And Liam Boyle. Mad, you need to unmute. There you go. There you... It, wouldn't let me, it wouldn't let me, first of all, unmute. So uh, I had to let you know that I couldn't unmute. I'm, I'm sitting here in my daughter's sitting room. You're all in your parents' houses. I uh, recently moved out of my home and into my daughter's home temporarily until I opened my, uh, my new schoolhouse in the spring stroke summer of 2021. <clears throat> uh, I'm, I'm from uh, Clare. I'm living in Clare, but I'm a Dublin woman. And uh, those of you from Ireland will know that Dublin beat the socks off Mayo yesterday in the All-Ireland Championship, so up the dubs. Uh, I'm very conscious too. That I was sitting here thinking, is it possible to have aural orgasms? Because I think that's what I've been having all night here, listening to all of the poets here. It's just been amazing. It's been amazing. I write very um, tough poems as well. I think uh, other people said that. And a bit like Angela Dribben, I'm waiting to be caught out and to be told that I shouldn't be here at all. So I'm gonna go straight in and read uh, a couple of my poems. I, I, very short poems, I write very short poetry because I can't concentrate for long enough to write long ones. Um, this first one, I, I'm just conscious that during these times, um, during COVID, not only are we faced with the pandemic, but with people with mental health issues, with people with domestic violence issues, um, and all sorts of other traumas that are being uh, dealt with during these times as well. And this, this poem is called Colours. There came a time when the rich red blood started to flow. There came a time when the purple bruises could be seen. There came a time when the child cried for what seemed like the entire night. There came a time when the sirens wailed, the blue lights flashing. There came a time when the sutures were inserted over a bluish black eye, an X-ray divulging buried white treasure of mangled mandible and rehabilitated fractures. There came a time when not so long after this, the yellow river flowed, the tackies were donned, the magician vanished into thin air. There came a time when she danced in her new orange shawl, swirling her way into the first rays of pink light, sweeping them close to her, blanketing them with her love and kindness and love and joy and learning and love, the marvel of her gift. There came a time too when they left, replete. There came that dark time too. This is my first uh, short poem. I'll read another short one if that's okay. Um, this one is called uh, Nightshades. And I, I um, facilitate a weekly writing group, and this is just one of the prompts we used. 
my lover sleeps silently beside me as I turn the page of yet another dog-eared first-year copybook, streaks of ink across paper, divulging secrets that would embarrass their mothers if they knew that I knew. I slide out of our soft, warm bed, down to the cold floor of the kitchen, delving into the light in the fridge for some leftover tempting tidbit. It's then that I see you outside my window, your head resting on the hard concrete. Don't call him Darren, they'd said, or Wayne. Waynes and Darrens always end up in trouble. Call him Seamus or Kevin. Good, strong, manly Irish names. Names that played football. Names that have lots of friends. Names that go to parties and enjoy full lives. Names that don't get knocked down by drunk drivers in the middle of the night. On a night like this, the moon a slit in the dark heavens, we found you by the side of the road, your battered heart unbeating. And finally, and very quickly, um, this, uh, I was very touched earlier on by the poem to, um, I, I think it was Anne wrote to her father. And my father was a 41 year old widower uh, with 10 children. And uh, he introduced a tidy drawer competition to his 10 children. And this is the tidy drawer competition. Each Thursday, he cycled from the Phoenix Park, pockets full of fruit pastilles, inspected our meager belongings, neatly folded, no color coding or Marie Kondo systems, Sunday underwear with Sunday socks, two good dresses, the blue poplin coat laboriously fashioned on the singer machine by her long bony hands, matching knitted cardigans, yellow Easter cardigans, softest pink mittens, plain pearl, plain pearl, fruit pastilles awarded to the victor for the tidiest drawer, rarely won by me. Thank you. Um, I want to um, thank Madge for her, her talk and uh, this is my first time with Cultivating Voices so I'd like to thank uh, Sandy for uh, allowing me to be here, here this evening uh, and I'm sure I'll be back. Uh, it's been a lovely evening, thank you. Um, the, my poem is called Now Only Memory. Now only, now only. Now only. No yesterday it is gone. No tomorrow it has not come. Now only. Once upon a time we walked along the canal under trees where new leaves waved an early summer breeze, casting shimmering shadows on the pram. The baby laughed, arms and legs flailing with excitement as we headed out from Hollis Street, the start of a great adventure. Now only memory. Only memory. A tepid claim, for memory is rich and layered. And what of dreams and plans, aspirations and expectations, as the flow of time's arrow reveals ever new tomorrows? We meet them with more than hope, negotiate a, a path, make a shifting now with remnants of fading yesterdays, feel the heft and weft of it, not a cutting edge, but whole cloth. No, no, no. I need to restate, not now only, but now and always, all our yesterdays, all our memories, all our dreams. We make of these our tomorrows in a world manifold and dense. Thank you. Thank you, Liam, and welcome. And we'll see you in the new year. It's been so great to have those folks who've been joining us for the first time today, meeting those folks that have been with us 
since the early, early days in March. Well, next, and we're coming, we're coming around the mountain, as we say, uh, is Eileen Sheehan joining us over from Ireland as well. And when I thought of a poet who only read once and that I'd really like to hear again, I immediately went to my salmon sister, Eileen, who read in our Irish showcase, our Titanic Irish showcase on April 14th and mesmerized me. I'd heard her read before, but that day, I don't know if it was the ship, you know, I have a lot to do with that ship, mesmerized me with her tales of mermaids and poetry by the sea. And I wanna give a shout out, although he's not here tonight with us, to Dominic Taylor and all those poets that gathered from Ireland that evening to help Cultivating Voices Live introduce our members to some of the, our most enduring voices in our weekly open mics. And you can look forward in the new year, in, particularly in the new book showcase to hearing from Michael Durack, Attractive A, John W. Sexton and others as well as our second annual Titanic Showcase in April. And so for Eileen, I wanted to show you, this wouldn't, I wouldn't be knowing you all if it weren't for this ship. And there she is, my oil painting of the Titanic. <laughs> I put her up today just for you. Thank you so much and joining Eileen after on the open mic will be Ruth Marshall, who just won the five word challenge and not the time to be silent, and Nadia Naiva. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks, Sandy, for such a great uh, introduction. And lovely to see your Titanic painting up there. Um, it's lovely to be back and cultivating voices. And even though I haven't read since April, um, I have been a regular attendee and have loved and uh, so many voices from so many different places. It's been an absolute joy throughout this really terrible year, to be honest. So thanks to you and Sandy for that. Um, I'm going to read two poems tonight. One is my own, the other isn't. Uh, if you're going to read someone else, read someone great, I say. Uh, so I'm going to read a poem that I, I suppose I fell in love with when I was very young. And I have a, a, still a great fondness and attachment to it. And it's a poem by one of our famous Irish poets, uh, Patrick Kavanagh. I, I think when I was very young, I loved it because I suppose he sounded a little bit like me in the sense that he was a rural working class poet. And in Ireland, we tend to hear a lot of maybe the urban working class poets, not so much from the rural ones. Uh, so he's, with, he's, he's a little hero of mine and of many people really, born in 1904 um, and passed away in 1967. Uh, so I'm going to read an extract from his poem, um, A Christmas Childhood. My father played the melodeon outside at our gate. There were stars in the morning east and they danced to his music. Across the wild bogs, his melodeon called to Lennon's and Callan's. As I pulled on my trousers in a hurry, I knew some strange thing had happened. Outside in the cowhouse, my mother made the music of milking. The light of her stable lamp was a star and the frost of Bethlehem made it twinkle. A water hen screeched in the bog, mass going feet crunched the wafer ice on the potholes. Somebody wistfully twisted the bellows wheel. My child poet picked out the letters on the gray stone in silver the wonder of a Christmas townland, the winking glitter of a frosty dawn. Cassiopeia 
was over Cassidy's hanging hill. I looked and three whin bushes rode across the horizon, the three wise kings. An old man passing said, can't he make it talk, the melodian? I hid in the doorway and tightened the belt of my box pleated coat. I nicked six nicks on the doorpost with my pinknife's big blade. There was a little one for cutting tobacco and I was six Christmases of age. My father played the melodeon. My mother milked the cows and I had a prayer like a white rose pinned on the Virgin Mary's blouse. <laughs> now, this is me. Maybe I should have read me first and then Kavanaugh, but anyway. Uh, <laughs> um, we don't get a lot of snow in Ireland. I know some of you have a lot of it at the moment. And it's just as well we don't really, because even when we get the tiniest bit, you know, we get, we get overexcited. The Irish can't be trusted with snow, to be honest. Uh, so this poem was written at a time of snow when we had maybe three inches and the whole country came to a complete standstill over it. It was great. Um, it, it, it was very memorable. It's also a poem about light, about real light and transcendent light, which is also real. Lady in white. Out of contrariness, out of blackguarding, out of the need for a small rebellion, myself and my daughter built a snow woman. Outside of the house, out of clump snow, we fashioned her. A sexy dame with a jaunty hat, big bellied and laughing. And we were laughing too and pleased to meet her. And she not at all surprised that we conjured her to appear for one night only in our small town garden. Meanwhile, word had spread and women from the neighborhood were gathering, leading small girls by the hand. The child from up the street squirmed through the laughter to present her own string of shining beads. The man from next door couldn't help but give a sideways grin at the sight of Madame in her finery. And as for herself, she just stood there coquettishly tilting her head and taking it all as her due. But later, as myself and my daughter held our aching hands to the fire, she remained looking in through the window, splitting her sides, growing thinner. By morning, she had disappeared like we knew she would. Snow being the wrong medium. Too slight, too cold to hold her. Until all around us, from the grass, the garden walls, the rooftops, the bare trees, the very air, there exhaled a kind of glistening. Thank you all. All right, Ruth, Eileen, thank you. Uh, I wrote in the chat, I was mesmerized by those mermaids and now I'm mesmerized by this snow woman. Oh, 
And I also wrote, it's great to bring the voices of our legacy poets forward in support of us. And that reminds me also of our tribute we did to Ivan Boland and the end of April as well. And so I'm always appreciative to carry those voices forward. Thank you. Well, I'm gonna interrupt briefly to just introduce Ruth Marshall on the open mic. And as I did, she just won the five word challenge at Not the Time to be Silent and is going, which is one of my, it, it is my favorite reading series in the world. Okay, I know, I shouldn't say that even though I am the host of this one, but it's my favorite. And uh, she just won the five word challenge at our reading on Thursday. I think she's sharing that terrific poem. Thank you, Ruth, for being with us and thanks for writing that poem. <laughs> <laughs> Great, thanks, thanks, Sandy. Um, I was going to read a different poem, and funnily enough, it was also about that time. Was it um, was it last year that we had those three days of snow, um, the big snow? And I might need to switch off my video so that. Ruth, I think you need to unmute again. Okay. Just let me know that you can hear me because things have gone a bit strange here. Oh, no, yep. I am unmuted. We can hear you. Oh. Yep, you're on, you're on now, you're good. Is it okay? Okay. The big snow. Only half ready when the first snow fell. As days passed, the vegetables ran out first, then milk. Fine for fuel, I let myself be generous with the warmth and burned in three days what would usually last a week. Grateful for the thick layer of snow that covered the house like a blanket holding in the heat. Thankful for the chance to stop, I sat by stove light, content to knit together three colours of Shetland wool, white, mm. red, black. My body remembered northern winters when I could not afford the luxury of warmth. I knew there were churches, mosques and halls with their doors open. But the thick feather duvet I had set aside for the homeless still sat snug in a biodegradable bin bag in the hallway, mm. reminding me of my privilege. I did not think far enough ahead. Mm. I turned the yarn, black, white, red, a spell in the knitting knotting, shoveled pathways to the woodshed and the gate, built mighty women of snow, took photographs and fed the birds scraps from the back of the cupboard. There were simple wonders. I felt blessed. Three days in the comfortable womb tomb of the big snow. Mm. On the fourth day, the snow woman had cracked, fallen, <laughs> and become no more than two lumps of coal and a pink stain on a white heap that I might pass by without seeing on a city street. 
thank you. And I'm really glad to be here at last. <laughs> <laughs> and I will be back, I promise. Hi. All right. Hi, Nadia. <laughs> Are you ready for me? Okay. Um, it's been wonderful to hear everyone read. Um, I'm going to read a poem of sorts um, and I'm calling it Echo Log. Driving around with a thrill, soothing with the music, we listen to the elastic rhythm drawing a body out of silence. I step out of bed and leave the house with the same words repeating in the center of my neck, the corner of my back. The kick drum echoes through the lake inside my foot, the swollen bone inside my nose. But really, I just want us to make it to the corridor so I can kiss you the way I've been meaning to and we can take it there together. I was with Lullaby, wanting them to reach out and touch me or to say something about how loving makes us stupid. It makes us too alive to speak to one another. How many more places will I wander off to with them on the left side scraping up leaves and dirt, looking like girls and boys confused together without future or past? closing down the six lanes of city with our bodies bowing to block the sunlight. It's not going to be night much longer. There's a new dawn preening its feathers on my back. If we walk out to meet it, we can walk backwards into its other mouth. I want to ask you, but feel too ashamed. If you come close and then reappear, I want to know. Can you make the day longer for me? Can you lie for me? Bring the water away from the earth with your expression. Cut back time from this season and wrap it around the next. We can walk all day through a cave without speaking. I'm dying to say good morning, but you look so tired from the journey ahead. I watch it spiral through your pupils, away from your heart. I'm happy and I'm waiting patiently for happiness. There's a dull bone caught inside my engine and I don't know how to fix it. A curve of ice gleaming on the lake this winter is going to be my closest friend. How beautiful the way light pours onto the surface and grows heavy before it goes away. I pick up the reflection and let it roll between my palms. What will this taste like in my memory tomorrow? A green flash of light comes dripping from the clouds. A message in a bottle. The bottle cracks open and a bird flies out. It's a winter scene we've been through over and over. The lake is an ocean with 10,000 miles of water. Being a poet, I wanted to be a poet. I wanted it to be the end of the world, the creature looking back at me, spinning my wheels. Every day is filled with spectacular moonlight, waves in the evening lullabies beaming through drywall, coloring it a new sound. So in short terms, I am dead. I am a creature with nine tentacles of the sand deserts and icy monoliths of space who swims to the bottom of life, waiting for love to come around again. Thanks. Oh boy, Nadia, I wish I could write a poem like that. <laughs> oh, thank you. Okay, I love you, you know that. Folks, I've known Nadia since she was three years old. So, you know, I gotta send out the love to her. <laughs> okay, well, folks, stay with us. Our last three poets are here with us and um, thank you all. I know we've gone a little long, but you know, I have a penchant for the epic. It's okay. It's, it's just time after all. 
So, and I appreciate yours always. Our next poet is Kim Ports Parsons. I couldn't invite special guests today, which I did because as I said, I didn't know would people come to my little party. So I, you know, I had to invite people ahead of time. And then everybody came to the party. So thanks all for coming to the party. I invited Kim because I couldn't invite guests without inviting Kim, who read in one of our earliest open mics and who told us in that open mic that she had not read publicly for 20 years. Kim now has become a name synonymous with Coating Voices live poetry, as well as also recently publishing her poetry, also probably after 20 years. I want to thank Kim. Kim has been one of those people who has been with us every single week. I believe you have been with us every single week, live, mostly live. Posting generously. You may be our top poster on the site, actually. <laughs> I, 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 I do check those things. And often you are the number one person posting even more than me. Folks like you, and I want to name a couple other people. Amy Berry, another person who was so, so supportive all the time during posting. Kate Wegerson, whom you heard earlier, another one of those people who is always, always posting and supporting people. Ruth Marie, all of the folks that support all of us who are reading are really what make our group so welcoming and encouraging cultivating voices. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to our Hopo, oh, reading. A thumbs up if you can hear me, Sandy. Fabulous. Sandy and I um, have been friends for a very long time. And there are so many gifts uh, our friendship has given me. Uh, poetic gifts, life gifts, gifts from the soul. And uh, this year it's been amazing to be in community with her and to have made so many poetry friends through this group, and I just love you all so much. Uh, I, am, I am just overwhelmed. My cup flows over with the beauty and the meaning and the joy and the brilliance of the poetry today. I have two poems to share. The first one is called Simply Solstice, and like the solstice, it is a truncated sonnet. Uh, shortest day of the year, longest night for those of us here in North America, and the beginning of the next year. Solstice. A new day begins at the onset of the dark. A new year begins in the sunset of the autumn when the world has sloughed off its own ripeness and the sky is a sleepy gold. Your hands find your harvest. You stand behind me, chin on my shoulder, a puff of steam on the glass. The old year falls away in this moment Red flashes reflecting on the snow, reflecting on our faces, cool fire. This is the time to shed a skin, the time for lovers to swallow each other whole, to lick their fingers clean. This is the time to lie down, to wait and watch the squares of purple light rise on the wall, fingerprints of mourning. Um, so in this crazy, messed up, misery-filled world 
poetry is such a balm, it's such a medicine, it's such a, um, it's such a gift. And um, this is a poem I actually wrote for Sandy, my friend Sandy, not the host of CV, though she is, and not the author of Both for Women, though she is, my friend, who over many decades, um, uh, I would say her, of her many gifts she's given me as a friend, laughter is one of the most profound. And as we all know, laughter helps us get through the day and get through the week and the life and everything. So this is called A Lesson in Joy for my friend, Sandy Yanon. Most days, the news presses me further into the reckoning of the dead horse we are beating. You know the one the drumming hoofbeats of our imminent demise. Not the earth, no. Whatever we leave or lose or toss aside or pile up, she will cover, grow over, wear down, grind down, transform to soil or bury under tar. 25 years ago, I bumped into my friend in the hallway of the building where we taught on a Friday afternoon. And I told her I was ready to cash it in and just go get lost somewhere. Let go of time and appointments. She looked at her watch, unbuckled the band, and then gracefully, confidently, skipped it down the tiled floor like a boy, skillfully flicking a stone along the skin of a perfectly smooth pond. She threw back her head and laughed with abandon, and I began to laugh too. And it was like the long, giddy glide down a very steep hill on a wide open country road after a hard pull on the pedals. Bless her and that tossed watch, how it has skimmed the surface on murky days, broken the skin of despair or grief with its joy, how the child in me has floated up, the child spirit who wants to live, to pick up a pebble, to carry it home to my writing desk, to ripple her laughter. Thank you, Sandy. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Kim. I love you, of course. And, you know, I did not know what everyone was going to read. So just I thank you for that. And I do remember that day oh so well. I have, I think, I think I told you when we talked about the poem when I heard it the first time. In my office that I haven't been in for months and months and months, I have a wall of clocks and none of them work. And it's my statement to time. And I have students come in and they're like, what time is it? And I'm like, I don't know, it doesn't matter. Like, you know, what matters is being here and now and uh, mechanical time be damned with all those clocks. and. That was that moment of me. I used to wear two watches and I took that one off and just cast it down the hallway. And that, that sounds like me. So, <laughs> so time be damned, but not poetry, right? Because, you know, poetry, poetry are our true clocks, I think. You know, there are sundials and, and our, our sextants and our compasses. And yeah, so thank you. And you'll be back with our special announcement in just a couple minutes. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh, folks. Next, who he's waited all night. He has waited all night to bring us this, ama this amazing thing I know he is going to share with us because he told me. We have Matt Mooney. And Matt Mooney has been with us also since early on 
And I have enjoyed every single opportunity to hear him read his wonderful poems that often evoke so strongly the Ireland of yesteryear and of, and of, uh, of, 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 his, of his hometowns and his boyhood. And what I love about Matt's poems is that I can see, feel, and taste it all. When I, hear, when I hear his work. His readings remind me of others who've joined us like John Carew, who could not be with us tonight, um, but Jen, Jen sends his greetings um, from Limerick. He was just in touch with me just a little bit. His internet doesn't work and I remember his reading so well. And Matt is joining us tonight with a sacred reading, both in Irish, and in English. Thank you so much, Matt, for your generous gift. Thank you, Sandy, for inviting me tonight to be among you on this very special Christmas, Christmas edition of Cultivating Voices. It's an honor to be part of the team tonight. And, and my heart is beaten with the emotion that, that that's coming across to me from all the poetry. And I have been wrapping my poems in Christmas paper for you. And now I'm going to unwrap them. And I hope you like them. First poem is an echo of Kim's poem. We're on the same line. Great minds think alike. Winter solstice, short poem. The winter solstice with a single ray from the rising sun comes true to us by clever design through an opening in the dark chamber of a stone age tomb. Filling it with gold, no vault could hold with such hope for us. A chink of light is enough to lead a soul out of darkness. Now, you spoke of the, the Dawn Guelga, and I'm going to read. Matt, for I think you need to unmute. Oh, yeah, okay. I'm going to read for you a poem called Ian Nolik, very, very popular in Ireland this time of the year, especially by Mara Bakati, who reached the great age of 98 recently. And after that, I will read a translation by Gabriel Fitzmaurice, great Kerry poet. Ian Olog by Mara Bakati. Le quindle nanangal tan sparema bracca. Ta fikal on taka sagi on gunuk. Odigan chene is take on the lapa. Lihi mock day and sin take shot the nut. Baki gundara salaha in a kune. And vijan a shucky gis a knee or a hut. Johnny de huinus a ligan a weather. Leah come up day and send tig shot and up. We seek your er lassa, Egyptian nehirta. Corrugan queer quailer. Be August Jock. The canna ola, the stocana hashida. A clehig mock day in send tig shot and up. Christmas Eve. A translation by Gabriel Fitzmaurice. With candles of angels, the sky is now dappled. The frost on the wind from the hills has a bite. Kindle the fire and go to your slumber. Jesus will lie in this house all tonight. Leave all the doors wide open before her. The virgin who will come with the child on her breast. Grant that you'll stop here tonight, Holy Mary. 
that Jesus a while in this household may rest. The lights were all lighting in that little hostel. There were generous servings of victuals and wine. For merchants of silk, for merchants of woolens, but Jesus will lie in this household tonight. And to finish, I will read you a poem of my own. Home for Christmas. Very much in the news all over the world at the moment. Home for Christmas. In a country kitchen on that Christmas day. Heavy condensation on the window pane. Hearing the sudden click of the small gate. Someone saw him come and said his name. His mother overseeing steeping, steaming saucepans and the white Stanley range. Her engine room looks out in hope. And then she sees her son firmly striding in the sloping path to home. Her heart fills with joy so warm and full, feeling that a wave from some distant ocean is sweeping her on to let him in, to greet him, and to tearfully embrace the unexpected one. Smelling the roasting goose, he drinks hot soup, talking firm and talk, united with his father. Slowly he melts into the man he was before he took the boat to England with his brother. He was glad that he'd made the journey west, like the wise men from the east had done. Belonging here, he felt it even in his bones. On a Christmas day, it was great to be home. Eva Karmila Mahagra. Slancha, Slancha, all right, my friend. Lovely, lovely. Oh, good. That's a fun. Lovely. All the hearts. <laughs> Thanks, Sandy. <laughs> my friends, we are at our final reader. I thank you, Matt, for reading. Josephine has, and I have talked about how invaluable it is to hear poetry in our home languages. And I invite more of that in the upcoming year of poetry at Cultivating Voices Together. So bring your home languages to Cultivating Voices along with the translations or not, because the ear can hear poetry in any language. Thank you, Matt, and Merry Christmas. And you Merry Christmas to you all. Nolly Connor. Our final reader today. Don is my Don Krieger is my special guest every single week. And every single day. I have had, I, I honestly can't say enough about Don. He stepped in to support cultivating voices to our move to Zoom. And when I've been had, when I had difficulty with going live to Zoom, Don said, I will be with you each week. And he's stayed with me for three months straight, every Sunday, unwavered, to make sure that we kept going week after week. You know, in addition to that support, I have had the unbelievable privilege to be able to talk with Don privately about poetry 
after readings, before readings, in between readings. And it has been a tremendous gift and encouragement to me to keep going with the reading series. He probably has, I don't, anything I can say is amplified 100% about how much I really care, love and appreciate Don Krieger. Also, as if the support were not enough, he's a tremendous poet. <laughs> there you go. And he shared his poetry in our new book showcase from his new book, Discovery. And honestly, he read a poem and I, you know, I hear a lot of poetry and I really mean what I'm about to say. He's got a poem called Our Shared Humanity, which is honestly one of the most significant poems I've ever had the honor to hear live in my life. And that's saying a lot, I've heard a lot of poetry. So with such admiration and love and uh, appreciation well beyond anything I can articulate, would you please welcome Don Krieger. Thank you everyone for being here. Let's see here, what's going on? Thank you everyone for being here and uh, thank you, Sandy. It's its own ample reward to be able to do something good for so many. I have a short, a cycle of short poems for you. Election day, palmetto bugs perch dead still or fly right at you. The day after I woke in the dark to a loud scraping, it was perched on a foam cup, rubbing its jaw on the lip. Another time I cut one in half with a hoe, both ends scrambled into the grass. Discovery. I mainly think about what no one knows, nor I either. How the brain works. Is God truly cruel? Why what I know as truth, you know as lie why you hate me and I you. In the beginning, Lot's wife died nameless, not because she looked back, but for remembering. In a sweet vision, I live naked small trees, wide spaced, warm shade, rich with apricots, a white beach in view, gentle surf, a dark squall rushing across the water, a walled colossus to the south, massive piers, men of all shades at labor, oars and sails, slanted ships, long and low, bilge and shackles, Babel, the towers at city center in flames, smoke and harbor stench, billowing silver in the sun. I have always longed to live simply in an orchard, figs and cedar, olives and almonds, ladders and baskets, gloves and fresh bread, each day time stretching to the evening cool. So many remember 
their past lives as princes. Like them, I long for Eden, where tyranny and forgetting were new. Our shared humanities, nothing is deadlier dogma, so beautiful courage, riskier faith, seductive privilege, more noble and just war, more profane indifference, crueler God, no greater truth, kindness, nor greater lie, color, nothing more human, discovery. Thank you, Don Krieger. I, it seems a perfect way to close our reading out for today with our shared humanities, because that's what we've been cultivating for the past 39 weeks. Well, I wanna thank all of our readers and um, before I ask you all to unmute yourself so we can give a rousing round of applause, I'm going to have Kim Ports Parsons share that special announcement that I've been alluding to all afternoon, evening, morning, depending on where you are in the world. Thank you. Uh, wow, I, I feel incredibly privileged to be the one to first announce this. I've gotten to work with Sandy and some folks from a wonderful organization to which she also belongs called the Olympia, po Olympia Poetry Network, which is celebrating its 30, uh, 30th year um, and is an amazing network of poets and poetry lovers in Washington. And Cultivating Voices and Olympia Poetry Network are teaming up to create an extraordinary event. Mark your calendars for Valentine's Day, Sunday, February 14th, 2021, for the first and hopefully not the last, Laureate Love Fest. We will be celebrating Poets Laureate from the US, from Canada, from Ireland, from small municipalities to large areas. And we are not gonna lay out for you tonight, everyone who is already committed. It's an extremely exciting list. Um, it will be a tour de force reading and it is going to be so large, we're anticipating that it will be a webinar so that we can accommodate everyone free, open to the public from all over the world. Um, thank you, Sandy, for this chance to work on this project with you. I hope all of you will join us. So mark your calendars. And as the weeks go by, we will begin to announce more details. And believe me, you will not be disappointed. <laughs> so hooray for CV and um, looking forward to that. And please add whatever else you'd like, Sandy. You did the event well. Join us, as Kim said, on Valentine's Day, February 14th, Sunday, 2021. All right, my friends, we've done it. We've had our open house. We've, we've celebrated together. We've cried a little bit today. We have enjoyed being with each other. And with our memories of those 39 weeks and looking ahead 
to the next year. We have tons of wonderful readings. I've been alluding to some of them today, and we just told you about our first, first. special event of the new year. So, so folks, how so about we unmute ourselves and give okay. ourselves Unmuting. a great round of applause. Unmuting. Woo! Thanks, everybody. Oh, so amazing. Oh, my God. Wow. What a reading. What a reading. The view 